Late Night Movies with Robin Zach. This is a podcast about cinematic oddities, where we discuss any media that is too bizarre, abnormal, or off-kilter for contemporary audiences. Occasionally, these projects gel. Most times, they crash hard into the realm of obscurity. Join us as we delve into the cult classic swamp. I'm Zach. And I'm Rob. And here on Cinemodities, we are going to talk about a certain scenario. A certain scenario in which you can play a movie for other people. You're in a group, maybe one, and you want to say, hey, I have a movie. I have some thoughts about it. I want to share it with you to get something from it. Maybe lead to a discussion. Maybe just weird them out. Some type of reaction. The example I've always used for this is late at night. You got someone in your clutches. Uh, but we have a, a subcontext now for the, the first time on Cinemodities. We have a series, and specifically in this series, we are focusing on Dean Norris. If you don't know who Dean Norris is, uh, you might know him as Glenn Sickleman from the Book of Henry. That was our first installment of the Dean Norris series. But now you're going to know him as whoever he plays in oh, Men, yeah. Women, and Children. So, Zach, I, I'm assuming you know this because maybe you had more of an ability to pay attention to this movie. What is his character's name? Uh, his name in this movie is Kent Mooney. Kent Mooney. Oh, jeez. Yeah, he's, he's Mr. Mooney. I'm writing that down because I will forget it. <laughs> As I've, I've mentioned before on, on Cinemodities... Uh, whenever I have to prepare for these episodes, I like to watch the movie, media, visual album, whatever, and I like to record my own commentary for it. And then when I make my notes, I kind of listen back to that commentary and write down all the things I want to talk about. And we have a first here on Cinemodities, uh, where my co-host Zach has actually listened to my commentary. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Zach. Uh, you actually listened to it as a commentary, right? You played it during the movie? Indeed, I did. I watched this movie with Rob's commentary track playing over the movie and me awkwardly trying to match up the audio so it was almost down to the second. I had it around 40 minutes and I finally nailed it and I was so proud of myself. That was going to be my next question, if you actually got it to sync up well. It took uh, because, me a while, because you didn't give me a start point. I was hoping that at the very beginning you'd be like, I'm going to start in one, two, three, go! And I just I got like a very like, okay, here we go, click. <laughs> and, I'm like, and I'm like, oh, don't did he do it? And I'm like, okay, got to restart now. I'm waiting for that moment. And it's like, and I, a couple of times. Like, I, I finally got it around 40 minutes in, just playing with like, <laughs> hit the like pause button for like two seconds, and then hitting the start button again. So I, I thought I had the thought to actually give you some indication of when you should start it, but I, I then completely forgot to do it at the end of the movie when I sent you the commentary. Uh, I blame the movie for that and what the movie made me feel. Um, but just so you know, when I start the movie in my commentary, it's already at like second four or five. <laughs> Okay, well, there we go. <laughs> well, good to know. So I was future reference for failure uh, just yes. from the get-go. But All right. so this, this is a first. Zach has never done this before, has never listened to one of my commentaries. Uh, so he kind of has a, an idea what I'm going to talk yes. about. I've seen so, inside. I've seen inside. Okay, so I have, to, I have to, not to cut Rob off, but I have to frame this debate. When I originally pitched this to Rob, I built this thing up. I, I think Rob could agree with that. I built this thing up to be like the second coming of Christ. I'm Very like, much. this this movie's going to blow you away. And if you've listened to the Book of Henry episode, you know that I said if Rob could survive this, he would truly be unbreakable. <laughs> but as I listen, I was excited. Like, like I told Rob, I wanted this commentary. I was genuinely excited for this because I figured this would be a perfect Rob movie. I've already kind of sold another thing we're going to talk about eventually is a Rob movie. But as I'm listening to this, like I put it on, I was like, I was so excited. Like I was like doing this at like 8.30 in the morning like on a Saturday. <laughs> That's how sad my life is and how excited I was for this. So I put the movie on. I, this is the third time I've ever watched it. And I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm pumped. And after about five minutes into the movie or so, when Rob did not start hilariously laugh at the fact of Adam Sandler depressantly looking at his son's porn history with a very awkward narration by an Oscar winner, I'm like, oh no, he's not going to find this as funny or as hysterical or as bizarre as I am. 
and a little piece of me died that day <laughs> because I feel like I said there's a I figured Rob and I were on the same wavelength and I learned that maybe we're not like there's still lots of parts of that we're all that we are on the same wavelength but this part just dimmed that just a little bit so I I, I figured Zach was going to say something like this I I realized almost immediately that I was not having the reaction he thought I was going to have as I was watching it. Uh, I think a little of my commentary reflects that. Um, but but here's the thing. You know, this was my first time watching the movie. That commentary was recorded in a first pass. And I, I'm not going to deny that those were my initial reactions. And with my personality, of course I played some of them up. You know, I might have hyperbolized a little bit or I might have That's nitpicked even some worse. details. Or, That's even worse. And so, you faked it. And so, no, but that's why I want to say that was, but that was my initial reaction. And now I'd like to give you, Zach, and the audience, I've had some time to think about it, to let this movie kind of sit with me, for me to, to really let it sink in, and I can, I can really tell you what I thought about it. Uh, to your point, I do find it a little funnier. Like, when I think back to certain scenes, I find it a little funnier than I did when I was actually watching it. So, you know, the beginning, Adam Sandler scrolling through his son's porn, com his computer, is for looking for porn, clicking on, like, escort websites. That was, that was pretty funny, now that I think about it. I did not laugh during the, the actual movie, though. But here's what I really think. Here's, here's kind of my full view on this movie. Zach, this, this is probably the worst thing I've ever seen. This is probably the worst movie <sighs> of all time. This is terrible. Okay, I, okay, I, I, we're, we're going to discuss this movie differently than we've had discuss other movies. Because if we try breaking down the plot to this, we will literally go insane. Both of us will go insane if we try breaking this down by a plot by point basis. So I'm, Absolutely. I'm not, not even going to attempt that. So Rob is correct. This is a horrible movie. I agree. This is a mess. <laughs> like this is a, like, and I think that's what. Okay, a little bit of context as to how. Okay, I saw this movie. I think when it first showed up on DVD, I got it from my local library. I completely forgot about it. I actually only remembered about this after I had pitched the idea of the podcast, doing this podcast to Rob. So we're talking like a month, month and a half ago. I was going through my local library, like picking a couple movies out that like I didn't have that I knew we want, I wanted to talk about. And I saw this on the show. I was looking for some movie that began with the letter M, and this was there, and I said, oh, Men, Women, and Children! And I did not remember a thing about it. All I knew was that it was hysterically bad. But like, I didn't remember any of it. So I rewatched it, like in the last, like prior to the Rob commentary viewing, and I was like, "This is a masterpiece of awfulness." And what makes it even better is that you have legit A-list actors in this. Like, there are genuinely like this. Are people know um, Rob? Do you know who Timothy Chalamet is? The name sounds familiar. Well, he just won the Best Actor Oscar this current season, so like a month and a half ago, for Call Me By Your Name. Okay. You know what? He was in this movie. You know what role he played? I do not. You know the guy who hits Ansel Elgort, Elgort's like, girlfriend in the head with an orange? Then he oh, yeah. the living snot out of him? That's him. He's in the movie for like three seconds, and he gets actually on the poster and in the opening credits. Like you have <laughs> the, the current Oscar winner for best actor gets punched in the face for hitting a girl with an orange. <laughs> See, he's okay, I did not know that. I, I'm going to sell him on this movie. Like I know going into this, I, 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 I this is uphill battle. This is going to be a steep uphill battle for me, but I am going to convince Rob. This is the definition of a masterpiece. Maybe I put him into this. I built up his expectations a little too high and I, I threw him in the deep end of the water. Not you know, you know what? I, I will take that challenge. I will take that challenge. Okay, that I, I, that I challenge. want you to sell on. I want you to sell me on this movie. Um, but I'm letting you know it's going to be tough. It's it not only tough. not only did I not find it laugh out loud funny. I think I just fundamentally disagree with the message and the point of this movie. There is no okay. You got okay. Much like Kylo Ren, you have to destroy the past. You cannot. There's no point to this movie. You have to walk into this knowing. I guess this is where I failed you. I sold okay again. Once again, I'll give a little bit of context. I sold this movie to Rob. Like, oh, this is going to be like comically like. Okay, I'm not even sure. Okay, Rob, how did I sell this to you? Tell me. Well, before you watch this, what were you expecting from this film? Okay, okay. So Zach gave me really two things. I would say um, the first was the to look out for the tonal shifts 
and you specifically mentioned to me the beginning like how the intro went from this big picture into their characters, you said I was going to laugh hysterically. And that was the part that we already mentioned, the Adam Sandler, you know, looking for porn on multiple computers through his house. <laughs> uh, the other thing that Zach told me were, were the words Nerf football. Yep. And, and that was kind of the big picture and everything else that surrounded those, because Zach just didn't sit me down and say those things to me. It was sprinkled with, you know, you're going to laugh. This is hilarious. It's trying to be serious, but it's funny. Um, something that both of us enjoy. Something that he knows a movie that I would love to sit down and watch and laugh at. Unfortunately, I, I don't agree at this point in time, but we're going to see if, if Zach can, can make an impact on that. Okay, so I want everyone to, okay, we're, we're not going to break this down plot, point by plot point, but what I'm going to do is pretend this is a trial. And I'm trying to exonerate men, women, and children. I'm trying to convince Rob that it is not guilty of any sort of crime against him. And I have to say, first, I did initially fail. I did not give him the proper context walking into this movie. Because I, thinking back, I don't remember what I thought the first time I saw this. Because it's funny. I went back through my like IMDb ratings in like February or like March of 2015, which is like right when the DVD came out, I rated this a three out of ten on IMDb. Oh. After I saw that rating, I said, "Oh dear Lord, what mistake did I make?" Yeah, I that's way too that. high. No, that is way too low. I tried rating it a twelve, and it said, "Sir, you can't do that. <laughs> you can't give it more than a 10. I said, "Fine, I'll settle giving it a 10. Did you call the customer service line? When yes, you uh, give it yes, a I did. I called IMDb customer service, and I got a very weird person on the phone. Oh. Um, so, okay, so I have to concede It's not fair throwing Like Much how Batman versus Superman Is, is 9-11 imagery And I like, and, and Eraserhead is the Toddler in the Atlantic Ocean I kind of did that to Rob to a lesser extent Except I put him in the deep end And this is where I'm I, I guess, I, As I was listening to Rob's commentary There were certain moments in the film Where I'm like, I, I am, I, this is the third time Watching this, the second time like in a couple of weeks and he is like, I'm dying laughing, knowing what to expect. And he's just <laughs> silent. And I'm like, I'm like, how is he not laughing at this? And I knew, and there was a moment at the very end, and this is a spoiler for all three of you who wanted to see this and didn't get to it until after this. <laughs> um, there's a point in the movie where Ansel Elgort, I'm gonna sound like a really horrible person for saying this, is committing suicide. And it's the most comical suicide I've ever seen put to film. I am peeing my pants laughing at like the sad music as he takes the was it Prozac or is it, do we know what it is? No, they don't even think that, I don't think they describe it's just generic pills. antidepressant pills. Would you agree? Yeah, it's just pills as far as pills. I'm concerned. Pills to wake, pills to sleep, pills, pills, pills every day of the week, pills to walk, pills to think, pills, 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 pills for the family. Whatever it is. He's taking his, like, he's sad, he wants to end his life, and he's comically taking one pill at a time the same way grandma feeds you penny candy when you visit her at her home. And it's just comical. I am dying laughing. I don't care. I'm not laughing at him killing himself. I'm not laughing at suicide. I'm laughing at how it's filmed. Usually when someone commits suicide, they take the bottle of pills, like take like the whole bottle, swig them in one thing, and take a swig of alcohol or whatever liquids around. In this, he literally puts them all on the table and goes, one, waits, cries, doesn't, it's like nobody commits suicide that way. Like that is so like over the top and just farcical. And I knew at that exact moment I had failed you, Rob. I'm like, I did not bring you into this the right way. Because well, did you, I, do you remember what my commentary during that part of the movie yes, is? Yes, that's why I'm going back to this point. You're like, oh man, this movie's actually making me feel something for once. And at that moment, I realized, oh crap, he's actually looking at this. And this is where Ross probably agree with me. This is bare, like, this is a movie in name only. Like, I would, like, uh, uh, during our Endless episode, I, I asked Rob, how are we, like, how do we describe Endless? Are we calling it a movie? Are we calling it a short film? Are we calling it like a media project? And he says, no, we're calling it a visual album. I would not feel comfortable calling this a movie because it does not fall on the, under any of the, other than having a beginning credits and ending credits, <laughs> I don't think it resembles a movie. It's much like, not to go off topic, but like the Fant Four Stick 2015 movie. I would not classify that as a movie. It, it, it's it's a movie in name only because there's nothing else to classify it as. It's like the Zapruder film of like Bigfoot research. It's like, I, what do you call this? It's not evidence because it doesn't exist, but it's it's something there to look at. 
That's what this is. And I think that's how you have to go into this movie. You have to go into it saying, this is not a movie. This is not a conventional narrative. This is somehow, uh, what's his name? Jason Reitman. Who, Rob, do you know who Jason Reitman is? So I, I looked into him a little bit after watching this movie because I disliked it so much. Uh, and the conclusion I came to was that he directed other movies I disliked. <laughs> Okay, okay, okay. But to be fair, though, a lot of the movies he's directed have critical praise. Like, he's directed Thank You for Smoking. Didn't like it. Oh, I love that movie. Um, and that's not sarcastic. I genuinely love that movie. Juno. Didn't like, hated that one, actually. I hated that movie, too. But, that movie. but people, you have to admit, people adore that movie. Yes, yes. He Everybody does have, loves Pregnant He does have a Page. great track. He had a great track record before Men, Women, and Children. Yes, if you look at his re- if you look at his filmography, he did Up in the Air with George Clooney, which is a very forgettable film, but it's a very it's a very competently made film. Like you watch that movie, it's not memorable though, but it does it checks off all the boxes of a movie. It's like, okay, it has a, a good cast, decent plot, moves the plot forward. It, it, it it's a movie. Like you could watch it on an airplane and be like, that was fine. Sure. Next. And then he did like the next really major movie he did was Young Adult with Charlie Theron and like Pat Oswalt. It's a weird movie, but it's it's a movie. It's it's a movie. And the very next major oh he had Labor Day. Labor Day is a weird. Yeah. Okay, there's a downward trend here. But when you hear like oh Jason Reitman who's the who's the son of famous director Ivan Reitman like, that like I knew. Ghostbusters like all these like comedies of the seventies and eighties that everybody knows and loves. And one of my favorite cult classics, Evolution, with David Duchovny and Julianne Moore. Oh, but, great movie. Yes, that is a great movie. So that might be a cinematic eventually, but I don't know. Uh, but no. So like, I heard – so like back during 2015, I heard about this movie. It made like $2 million. It. Like worldwide. And I'm like, how on earth does a movie directed by a top-rated talent, uh, talented filmmaker starring – Jennifer Garner, Judy Greer, Adam Sandler, Ansel Elgort, J.K. Simmons, Fillmore, because why not? Oh, like, yeah. how, like, how doesn't like, how's that movie bomb? To, and, like, to nobody... put this in perspective, we did say that the Book of Henry made four million, right? Yes, it doubled the grosses of Men, Women, and Children. Wow! Yeah, wow. let that sink in. And yet, MacGruber which we'll get to eventually, did double the business of Book of Henry and still also bomb. See all yes. these movies. See all these movies have something in common here. Uh, <laughs> but, but like, so going back to, so it's like, that's what it's the, again, going back to like the tonal shifts, which I, I might've mischaracterized this. I don't think there's any massive tonal shifts in this. I think it's like, I, okay. One thing I always find, I don't know if it's a pet peeve or something I find fascinating. I think it's really interesting when like a filmmaker or, or morbid fascination, when a filmmaker takes underage actors and puts them in like really awkward circumstances, they're just like, it's one thing like taking like a 16 year old and doing a coming of age story. That's fine. Like it's like, Oh, coming of age. Yeah. No problem. But when you do take underage actors and you have them doing like all these weird things, like in this movie where you have a bunch of like cheerleaders talking about, well, did you give a, did you hook up yet? It's like, okay, like that's plausible. But like, like they start discussing, discussing like how salty his, the guy's thing is. I'm like, what? It's like, why are you, like, I'm not ar- arguing whether that happens in real life. It probably does more often than you probably think, but it's like, why are you did, in a movie? Like that's not compelling dialogue. That's bizarre that, and I think going giving Rob a little bit more context on this, like when any and he he knows this too. When you make a like a block not blockbuster, like a Hollywood movie, like so many people have to sign off on something before it finally hits the screen for you to see. There's just levels of red tape and bureaucracy. And so like when you get a scene like that and nobody says, maybe this isn't a good idea, it's just <laughs> like, I'm amazed by that. It's kind of like the whole, it, it's just, you never see something like that in like any other industry other than Hollywood. And it doesn't happen often. So when you get it, it is like, I think the best way to describe this film, it is the Sapruder film or like, uh, what was it? Um, okay, what's the Bigfoot video? The, the one with the, the guys walking through, like it's a, the infamous <sighs> Bigfoot video. Like everybody yeah, knows. Like, I don't like, remember I the name of it, but I know what you're talking every about. Every once in a while. Okay. But you know what I'm talking about. Definitely. It's that. That's what this movie is. It's like a Bigfoot, like footage thing it's shaky i have no idea what i'm looking at but there's something there that i can't explain no matter how hard i try and i think that's how you describe this movie 
it's it's so unique in that circumstance that I think I, at the same time I tried building this up for Rob, but at the same time I don't think there's anything I could have done better because it's so inexplicable. You know, you know what I I see where you're coming from. I, I think I understand your perspective, but I I just didn't get that. Uh, one of the biggest things that I took this movie as was it, it was trying to be American Pie but classier and more dramatic. Like, that's what I felt this movie attempted to do. Like, it wanted to, to be a, a more, I don't know, compelling and, and gravity-holding film dealing with the same things that these, you know, teen comedies have dealt with, like these sexual teen comedies. Because just the... I'm, I'm breaking this, Zach. You, I'm stealing your thunder because I'm sure you want to talk about this. There's a scene in this movie where a guy cuts a hole in a Nerf football pumps a bunch of moisturizer into it and fucks it. Like, that happens in this movie. And that scene, I was like, mm, this is just him. This is Jason Biggs fucking the pie, right? From American Pie. This is the same but, exact concept. But, but you have to, okay, this is one thing about this movie, though. This movie does not have any comedy, like, no intentional comedy in it, though. Oh, sure, There's that's no what I'm saying. It wanted to just take the, the foundation of those comedies, but make it serious. And that's, that's what they attempted to do. That's what I thought of it as. I agree, and, that's, and I think that's what makes it so fascinating. Because, like, it's, is it possible for filmmakers and actors to be that, that tone deaf, that they see this for what it is? I, for like what's on the page, what's on the script, and say, you know what, this is going to work. There's no reason why it would work, but it's like, and, and nobody said no. Like at one point in the movie, did Adam Sandler say, "Why am I?" Like, did Did Jason Reitman just put him in front of like a blank computer and just say, "Look confused," and then tell him at all what he be what his character supposed to be doing in the movie? <laughs> because like if that ha like, that would make sense. Like he's like, okay, Adam Sandler, you're gonna be looking on the computer for something. And Adam Sandler, like I guess Adam Sandler's like, as long as the check clears, I don't care what you do with me. I think that's just at the, at the stage of his life now where he's just like, I have more than enough money. I don't care. Like, that would make sense, though. And I think, like, I know there's at one point during Rob's commentary, he's, like, screaming, like, is, is every character going to have a text message bubble over their head? Why does everybody need a text message bubble over their head? And it's like, was that what was happening during this movie? Like, none of the actors knew what was going on, like, in the digital space, like, the digital realm of this movie, where, like, everybody's texting and tweeting and IMing each other? See, because well, I, I thought that, uh, two things to respond to that. One, no, they didn't know. I can't think that they know knew because it's it seems so disjointed, like the the acting from the the actual story and what we're seeing half of the time. But the other thing I want to say is, I thought that they just filmed Adam Sandler at home on his own computer, and that's just how he <laughs> looks at the computer. Like I don't think that was him acting. I think they just had him. They just you know candid camera, like turned his webcam on NSA style, and that was just Adam Sandler on the internet. But, okay, you bring up the Adam Sandler thing again, which I think this scene might be one of the most important scenes in the entire film because it sets the mood. So, like, you like you have the very opening credit sequence is what? The, the Voyager satellite yeah, the going Voyager, through the solar system? The narrator talking about uh, people and their insignificance, all that yes, stuff. Yes, the, 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 the how things are grand and how nobody matters. So you have this entire thing. You were watching this. And you figure, okay, it's talking about how all, all of our petty life occurrences mean nothing in the grand scheme of things. And then cut immediately to Adam Sandler, who is known worldwide as a funny man, as he's trying to log on to his computer. And the narrator says, here is Don Truby. He's trying to access his computer, but he can't because it has so much malware on it because of all the pornography he looks at. Like, that sets the tone for this movie. Like, even though I failed setting Rob up for this, that scene... Or that immediate just hard shift into like, what? It's like you're going like from extreme philosophy into a guy trying to look at pornography on his computer yet can't. And has to resort to his son who has like this absurd browsing history. It's like, like that tells you everything you need to know about this movie. At this point you say, this is not a movie. This is a movie that's trying, that, that was sold as something else. And it's going to make, it, it's... I describe Book of Henry as like a lifetime movie. This is beyond the bounds of a like the most absurd lifetime movie. Like soccer moms would be watching this going, nope, and turning it off. And I think, even though I'm upset at the fact that Rob hate do you hate this or just dislike it? I would say I hate this. Okay. Deep down. I, even, though, 
even though Rob hates this movie, I think it did its, in my eyes, in my very specific set of eyes, I guess it did its job in that it disenfranchised him. <laughs> I, 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 I guess that's the I, it, I, one thing we talk about with like cinematis. Cinematis shouldn't be appreciated by everyone. I think if they are appreciated by everyone, it deve- they don't become cinematis. Like people say, Star Wars is the world's first, like or the, the world's only cult, like the largest cult classic film. And I'm like, no, a cult classic cannot be a billion dollar franchise. It just can't. It defeats yeah. the purpose. It has to be small. So I think, like I said, we're, again, we're still trying to find cinematis. Like, yeah, we have a basic idea of what it is, though. But I think the further we go on doing this and we add more films to the canon or remove films or we bicker and debate about films, I think like, at the same time we want to get people into these films. But sometimes a movie has to be voted off the island. Like, or, like it needs to not be appreciated by anyone. Uh, except for me, who is a psychotic, who likes weird crap like this. <laughs> it's like it, ne- it needs that level of nobody understanding it, I, and I think that's what's going to happen to men, women, and children. I don't, care. I don't think I'm going to be able to convince Rob because I, I he walked into this and even go like even the scene with Adam Sandler. He's looking at the pornography and he's like looking at his son's browsing history and he's trying to settle on what he's like. What is this? It's like titty cream pie. What? And, like, he just shrugs his shoulders at one point and literally just comically throws his tie over his shoulder because he doesn't want any blank on his tie. It's like, <laughs> oh, my God. I, I, I died laughing at that. Like, I'm like, oh, my God, this movie. It's a, uh, it's a niche movie, an extreme niche movie. Is that it's what we're mo- saying? It's, it's not – okay, how do I say this uh, correctly? It's not for everyone, but it's hardly for anyone at the same time as well. It's such – it's like – it's a movie that's when you try to appeal to everybody at the same time you appeal to no one. And I think that's where this movie falls. It falls into this weird thing where it's like, okay, no one's going to appreciate it except for this schmuck who got it from the library two times over the last three years. Sure. Okay. So I, 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 I agree with you. Maybe you can do some convincing on some certain parts for me, but I think overall you're making a good point. This is, this is sex. This is not mine, and, and we're pretty steadfast on this. Um, I do want to separate out, though. There's Even for my dislike, my hatred of this movie, there is, you know, a filter to it. Because there are funny parts. There are parts that I do think are very, very comical. And I do want to talk about those. But at the same time, I think... I deserve to. I deserve the chance to explain how messed up the message of this movie is, or how poorly they they try and explain the message that they're going for. Can we? Do you want to get that out of the way, and then we uh, can talk about the nonsense? <laughs> oh no! no I, I, I don't think we're going to be bl- breaking this down point by point because I think no anybody who wants. Okay, for the record, if you like. Oh, okay. Have you seen the room? You've seen the room, right? Tommy oh yeah. Lysa. Oh okay. yeah. Okay. Would you classify this as of the room? Where it's just so like like bizarre and like in off the wall, just like weird. Would you put it in that same realm? You know what? I I would. I think the only separation I can think of right now is kind of my ability to watch it. Like it, I think it's just because of the the material and the topics they're covering. I'm more willing to sit through the room than I am this. Okay. But okay, going back, if you want if you want like a weird movie going experience where it's like how on earth did this get made? How does this exist? I think this is a prime candidate for that. If you want that sort of experience, please watch Men, Women and Children. <laughs> Go ahead, Rob. Okay, so here's my here's my big big problem with the movie. And Zach knows this cuz I think I I rant about it the whole movie and then at the very end. Um, the two main problems that I have with this uh, the first is in structure. The first is in storytelling. So the whole point of this movie is that we follow all these characters that are connected in some way, but we really get, you know, individual arcs for each character, and we follow them throughout this big intertwined series of events. Uh, They make each separate story hit the same thematic points, like the same beats of a story, at the same time in the movie. So, you know, we get 30 minutes into the movie, all the stories have hit, you know, their exposition and we're getting into that second act kind of thing. We hit an hour mark of the movie. All the characters are doing something sexual and they're all like cheating on another or like doing some crazy sex thing. And all these stories hit the same point at the same time. 
And the only thing I can think is, why have six different stories telling me the same exact thing? There is no difference in what I should be getting from each story. Sure, there's difference in what they're actually showing us and who the characters are and their motivations, but there's no difference in motivation between any of them. It's just like someone wrote one story and copied it six times, changed the people's names and said, this is a movie, right? What do you think about that, Zach? What did you think of this story structure? But, okay, I, I, guess I can't even look at it that, with that sort of lens because I'm not even looking at it as a movie. I'm seeing this as like, this is like, a, like okay, I'm going to make a Simpsons reference. There's a, <laughs> Simpsons, there's a Simpsons like bit of an episode where Homer wants a barbecue pit. And he goes. I know, to the store I know, buys, I know the one you're talking about. Okay, you know what I'm talking about. And he takes the boxes out of the, like he opens the box and like he has like the cement pit, like where it's the wet cement. He goes, he goes, ah! And all the pieces like fall in the cement. He goes, quick, gotta build barbecue quick. And he's like doing all these things. He's like this, and they have all like wet cement. He's just sticking pieces together. He's jamming things through there and then cuts to the very next scene. And it's a picture of the barbecue assembled. And he goes, wow, that's a one fine looking barbecue pit. And then we see he pulls the box away. And then we see this giant pile of just mess laying in front of him. He goes, why doesn't mine look like that? Oh, yeah, that's a fine looking. Oh! Okay, no big deal. Uh, uh. Ah! Stupid Lisa! <laughs> she gotta build fast. Cement drawing! All right, let's see. Oh, English side ruined. Must use French instructions. Le Grill? What the hell is that? Oh, come here, get, uh, come on, fit you. I mean, uh, just get, get, huh? Uh, uh, yeah, that's one fine looking barbecue pit. Why doesn't mine look like that? Uh, uh, and that's what this movie is. Rob's looking at this critically, saying this does not work as a movie. Where no, I'm, just I've as, cons- just as anything you deliver, just as a story you deliver to any other being, it, I, it I, makes I, no I, sense. I, I agree with you here. I, I agree with all your. I, I'm going to imagine. I'm going to agree with all the points you make in that how this is not good, how this doesn't <laughs> work. I can see all that, or I agree. Like this is not, this does not work at all. The problem is that, not the problem, but my thing is that I'm looking past that saying, this is a mag, like the same way in that Homer Simpson episode, Homer eventually t- rips it all out of the ground, is putting it by the garbage, and the like. The art dealer comes by and says, oh, I must have it, how much do you want for it? Rob sees it as a pile of just cement, cemented junk that doesn't work, it just makes no sense. I look at it and say, this is brilliant, a one-of-a-kind item, and I would never trade it for anything. But getting back to Rob's point, because it's not interesting to hear Rob say this is an awful movie and me saying, yes, it is awful. It's a masterpiece because it's so awful. Um, I I know it's really cliche now to say, oh, it's so bad, it's good. Like, no, like I hate that. People say, oh, Trolls 2 is the best, worst movie ever. No, Troll 2 was was incompetent. You had a foreigner making a film that had no right behind the camera. He worked cheap and that's why he got hired. You had a bunch of actors that weren't, that barely were actors. Like, they were just people. This is like, everything is like, a top shelf, high caliber, A plus level, and it doesn't. It's like, and they're trying. Yeah, it doesn't work. Like I agree with you. You have a numerous time during Rob's commentary. He's like, oh, like what? What? I think Tor Gang's like, why are all the stories hitting the same B at the same time? Just make one narrative. Pick a set of like three characters and focus on them instead of thirty five. And I agree. But at the same time, though. You have all these different avenues, and yes, they're all hitting the same piece. Like you have like, okay, I'm trying to think, like, like the sexual exploration of the teenagers. Mm-hmm. Or you have Adam Sandler and his wife sitting there having their sexual exploration, him with a prostitute, yep. and her with a, a man like who's also in Unhappy Marriage, the Allstate guy. Uh, is it is it all state or state yes, farm or um, it is all state? When you said state farm in the commentary, I started yelling. But didn't I, really, I correct myself at one point? Yes, you did correct it, but you okay, didn't good. notice. Okay, I really, I really want, I want to have a commentary of me listening to your commentary, <laughs> and so you could listen to. It. You have no idea how bad I had to fight back doing that. I'm like, I, I'm like, oh, wouldn't that be great if like I record a commentary listening to like reacting to Rob's commentary of this movie. So then he can listen to me reacting to him reacting to the movie I recommended. And we would like, just keep going, just keep recording yes. layers of commentary. Until eventually you'd hear a gunshot on the last Rob commentary <laughs> and a loud thud. Okay, so going back to Rob's point, though, yes, this movie does not work on any level. It really doesn't. It's like you have all these things, 
it, it, it's so cliched. Like, like at one point in the movie, you have Ansel Elgort's girlfriend, and when we're first introduced to her, they're both like in the principal's office, and she's reading a book oh, right after God. we have the scene where he's wa- Ansel Elgort's walking down like the school hallway. Everybody has a text message bubble above their head, and she's reading a book. And Rob's like, "Oh, look! It's so cliched. She's reading while well, everybody's engrossed in their technology. How original!" And yet that's why this movie is so perfect because of how cliched <laughs> and suburban it is and just so by the numbers. It's like Jason Reitman thinks he's that he thinks he's better than you and I. I imagine if he came into this conversation right now and said, hello, I'm Jason Reitman. Because I think that's how he sounds like. <laughs> it's like. I would imagine if we talked to him for more than five minutes, he thinks he's better than us. Like no doubt about it. Like my dad's Ivan Reitman. Did your father make Ghostbusters? <laughs> it's it's like he thinks he's doing something that's he thinks he's making art here or at least highbrow entertainment mm-hmm. and this is the furthest thing from highbrow like this is like some i i i, I guess i'm wrong though, but i would imagine a slack jawed yokel will get another simpsons reference but i like i said i, I and that's why I, rob's gonna bring up all these really good analytical points and i feel bad that i always keep resorting to the same argument but i know it's bad but go ahead, Rob. Maybe I, maybe the more you keep talking about this, maybe I'll break away from that constant N- argument. No, no. You know what? I don't think Zach can. Like we said before, this this is one where Zach and I are just going to fundamentally disagree. There's nothing wrong with that. But I think this is one where it's just, you know, Book of Henry, we disagreed if it should be a late night movie. And we had things to talk about because we had opinions to stand behind. This one, I think it's a little kind of more like we're on separate sides of the world. Like our yes. opinions don't even know the other a version of that exists. They don't even see the light of day on that side of the planet. Um, you know, that's those are my problems. Well, those analytical well, things. Pasek, I agree with your I agree with your diagnosis. But I think I disagree with your conclusions. Like, everything that you're pointing out, I agree with. It's like, okay, this doesn't work. That doesn't work. And you're concluding, oh, it's, it's, it shouldn't be watched because of these reasons. And my conclusion is you have to watch it for these reasons because there's nothing else that's trying <laughs> yes. to do this. Yes. I guess I, agree with, I guess I agree with him for the most part. It's just the outcome. Yes. We, uh, we have a fork. That's a good way to put it. Yeah. Fork to opposite sides of the planet. <laughs> We, we just disagree on the conclusion. I agree with Zach on that one. Um, so we can't, we shouldn't, I should say, harp on this too much because, you know, we're not going to break any ground here and deeply analyze anything in this movie and, and reveal any unseen truths that we haven't figured out. Um, but the one thing else I want to talk about, I want to get your opinion on at least, is kind of the final message of the movie. I would say the last bit of the movie with the last, uh, you know, voiceover from the narrator... Uh, I took it to mean basically, you know, what we do in our lives is insignificant in the grand scheme of things, but it doesn't matter if it's insignificant because it makes us feel certain ways and we just do it because we're people like that's kind of the message I thought that they were they were going for. What do you what did you get from the end? All right, I'm going to have to humor you because I, I guess I don't take this movie seriously. But yes, yeah, yes, I yes. Guess I'm going to have to humor you because I, I'm like, what? I'm like, he's like, Jennifer Gardner unplugs the thing from the wall. It's like, and there's no resolution to the girl who had the naked pictures on the internet. I'm like, what is this? Um, but no, like, I get the whole idea, yes. Just because our lives don't mean anything in the grand scheme of things doesn't mean that we don't have an impact on one, one another. And that ties into the whole thing that happens at the end with Jennifer Gardner telling Ansel Elgort to leave... Lee again, I guess impersonating her daughter, saying like, "Oh, leave me alone." Mm-hmm. Like, yes, it's like just because we don't matter, we do have an effect on each other. Yes, but uh, here's my big problem: everybody in this movie that they focused on, and every story—well, the one story that they focused on—was relationship based. It was really all about their relationship with relationships with other people. That's not what life is. There is so much more to life than that. Like, that was my big problem with the ending, or the, really the ending of this movie, them wrapping everything together and saying, oh man, life sucks, but this is what we do as people. We just, you know, get in relationships. And yes, we do that, but there is so much more to life. I felt this movie was just squashing so much of the of the beautiful complexity of life and and the difficulty of things and not just oh teenage relationships 
I'm not looking at the message for this. Like, like would you? Okay, this is my. Okay, this is my issue. This, okay, this goes back to my argument of how I'm going to convince Rob this is a cinematic. Would you look at Tommy Wiseau's The Room and say the point he's trying to make about adultery and a betrayal of a friendship and things like that doesn't make sense? Would you? Would you look at? Would you look at The Room the same way you look on look at this movie? You know what? I I, I don't think I can say that. Obj- uh unbiased anymore because i i saw the disaster artist i've done the research into the backstory of the room and that really changed my opinion on the room so i i feel like i kind of do see more of a message from the room now well not well forget the context rooms we don't know the history to men women and children like yeah, yeah that, that's seen... what i'm saying that's my that's my difference in lens but okay but just looking at the the the, the, the room itself this isolated by itself no no you watch it for the first time you have no idea all you know is you have this weird foreigner who has this weird accent, and you have like all these like actors who can like, and you have Denny, who you have no idea how old Denny is, and he likes watching them have sex or like be in the room with them. It's it's that level. Like, would you look at that movie and say, I I don't understand, like the room fails in trying to convey the message of a best friend betraying another best friend over a woman, and that whole thing. I I think you're missing the forest through for the trees. It's it's just that whole idea of like. I'm introducing this into the cinema of these, not for any part of its under the surface reasons or its messages, because I think its messages are tone deaf. I think they're dumb. They're conveyed in the worst way possible. And like I said, you have a, okay, I'm trying to think of a plot point in this that really, like think about the, okay, uh, this is one plot point. Judy Greer, everybody loves Judy Greer. Oh yeah. Judy Greer is an adult. Judy Greer takes pictures of her underage daughter and puts them online so her daughter can have a career in entertainment eventually. I would imagine the amount of people that have done that since the internet's been developed, if you could fit them in a shoebox, it would be a lot. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The amount of people that have taken pictures of their underage daughter, not for like their own sexual gratification, but for some weird way of advancing their child's career, I don't think that has happened maybe more than... Ten times, because I, you would agree, Rob. In this film, it's it's not like Judy Greer is a pervert, right? There's there's no incestual undertones in this film. No, no, it's it's really about it. Really is about her daughter's success. Yes, and yet Judy Greer is obviously aware of the fact that this is highly illegal because she goes to Jennifer Garner's like like uh, neighborhood watch meeting. Type yeah, of neighborhood thing. watch meeting about like the 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 perils of teens on the internet. And it's like, what? I'm like, how is that anything to relate to? It's the same way watching The Room. It's like, who on earth is like, has anybody ever had a The Room level experience with a friend or a, a girlfriend like Lisa? It's like, no. I, I, this is like, it's a movie where you have so many different characters. Yeah, I don't think, and I think you've said, you said this during your commentary. Who, how am I supposed to relate to any of these characters? Yep. And I think, again, it's like watching The Room or Eraserhead. You cannot identify with these characters. It's not that type of movie. It's, it's a movie where like, they, they want you, like, Jason Reitman wants you to identify with these characters, but he just has no idea how to do it. Like, he, he was able to, like with Juno, a lot, like Juno resonated with a lot of people. Um, up in the Air, to a lesser extent, resonated with people. Thank you for smoking, again, to a lesser extent. But like Juno, so he knows how to do that. He obviously forgot how to do that because he can't do it anymore. You make but good no. points. I, uh, I think that it's just uh, the message was too uh, hitting me over the head. And I disagreed with it so much that I just couldn't see the movie in that way. Because you make a really good point bringing up Eraserhead. You know, it's and not me because I love Eraserhead, but you get someone else who's never seen it. And you watch it. They're going to be like, what the fuck? Why am I watching this? This is a waste of time. Let's get into some of the, the more fun aspects. Of this OK, thing. yes. So, yeah, we are we're saying that, you know, this is Zach and I have different opinions on this. Um, but one thing that we can agree on is that there are some funny moments to this movie. Yes. Uh, do you have a list of funny moments? Should we like oh, trade off or do you I, just have them in your head at this point? I. I was writing. I was I was writing a list, and I think I got like ten minutes into the movie, and I said, "You know what? Not worth it. You can't. You can't. It's like it's like trying to explain to someone why a joke is funny. It's like, I cannot contain the humor. It's like I gave up halfway through. I'm like, you know what? I'm not even gonna keep a list anymore. There's there's no point. Okay, okay. Well, you already brought one up. Can we start with that one? Uh, which one? 
uh, prettybitchesneverate.com. My favorite website. <laughs> yes, so we have a scene in this movie where a girl who is anorexic uh, gets home from school, runs right into a room, goes on the computer, and types a URL in prettybitchesneverate.com. That is the name of the URL. That was funny. That made me laugh for sure. Uh, and not too long after, which I think makes that scene, uh, what does she post on that website? I think it's on that website. Just the phrase, tormented by a slice of shepherd's pie. <laughs> see, that's what I mean, though. Okay, you should see, okay, if anybody else saw Rob on the camera, he is laughing at that. Uh, yeah, that is that is comical. It's, that is funny. It is. And, that's, and this movie is made up, like, this movie is made up of those moments. It's made up of a small, just like, to most people, it wouldn't be funny. And I think, I guess, I don't, I, we're going to get, get to this later, though, but like, whether we show this to people, I obviously, I think, I think it's a foregone conclusion what Rob's <laughs> thoughts on this are. But like, like I said, I think what's most devastating about this movie was that I figured this was the, Rob was the only person I could show this to who could appreciate it. And yet, even, this was a bridge too far, even for him. Which I think might be this film's genuine ach like, crowning achievement in just awfulness. <laughs> I'm sorry, but go that, ahead. Yes, pretty. That's a good. No, no, that's a that's a really good point that you bring up, Zach. Um, you know that that Zach knows my taste in movies, or at least whenever he has a movie that he's like, I Book of Henry. Did. Book of Henry's a great example. Like he was like, you should watch this. Don't look into it. Just watch it. And I watched it and immediately had um, tons of stuff to say about it. Uh, but this did that is not the case for men, women, and children. And that's a great point you made, Zach. That really is the testament to how deep down there this movie is. It is. But like I said, pretty bitches never eat. Like that's uh that is a genuine like the fact what's even funnier about that, it's not just simply the URL and the tormented by Shepherd's Pie. It's a fact that it's an active website with like four or five people immediately responding. To her. Oh yeah. Oh, it's yeah. like it's not like she types it in, she waits for a response. Cause I think that would be a more relatable thing. Like we've all been on like a website before work where we've commented or wrote something online, and you like that happens a lot, you know, you write something and you never get any feedback on it. Positive yeah. or negative. It's, it's, I've described it before, much like how I tell Rob about this podcast. It's screaming into the void. <laughs> and that's what happens to a lot of people. A lot of people like, like post something really clever on Twitter or Facebook or Instagram or whatever, and they never get any feedback. No likes, no retweets, no whatever you, you do to get people like saw it. But I this girl gets real time feedback. chat, like real time chat, other anorexic people telling her how to beat the shepherd's pie. It, it really, oh man! <laughs> and then the best part, and then the best. Okay, so it's worth establish. It's it, the movie doesn't even properly establish this because, like, we see this girl and she's with the Judy Greer's daughter who has the underage pictures taken of her, and she's with another friend. Because originally, when I watched this movie, I'm like, oh, it's gonna focus on these three girls. Mm -hmm. Where I thought, oh, maybe that's Ansel Elgort's girlfriend. Like, oh, maybe like, and then like, obviously, kind of realize, okay, no, she's not. And it's like, oh, okay. And they, they go down these different paths where it's like, okay, how's this all going to tie in? But they, the one that's anorexic, it's not really – like, yes, you have this scene like prettybitchesnevereat.com. But then it's like, oh, was she originally overweight? And then it's not till later that there's some exposition that she was overweight mm -hmm. and arguably the greatest piece of narration ever in cinematic history. Okay, well, okay, I got to find the name of the, the boyfriend. Or not the boy, the guy, the guy who she has like the – the uh, abortion with. Oh, <laughs> whatever oh God. his name is. Well, uh, I, I don't know what his name was. Uh, I have no idea what his name is either. <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I'm going to call him Dave because I think it's a safe name. He's a jock. And, He's Dave the Jock. Dave the Jock. I don't even know what sport he plays. He's wearing a jacket. He has, he's not a football player. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's a good point. <laughs> that's what. See, that's another hilarious moment. I was watching this movie. I'm like, wait, because during the football game, he's in the stands during during the game. Like, why does he have a? Jo he's a jock, but he doesn't play football. Like, what sport does he? Like, we see him. Like, he's a jock, yet we never see him <laughs> doing anything sports related. He's just jock. He's jock man. Yep. And but we know the fact because again, like going through weight loss or like anorexia, there are people out there like as they're growing up, they like they're like average weight or like mm -hmm. slightly below average, but because of like societal norms or whatever, they feel the like the nudge and the pressure to like become anorexic to even lose more weight. So there's no explanation like oh this girl was like really really heavy until we get narration from Emma Thompson. 
Brandon remained the object of Alison's affection, despite having once said within earshot, I'd fuck her if I could find the hole. Greatest film, greatest line of dialogue. Movie, give up, you're not going to top yourself. <laughs> Little did I know about the greatest suicide scene in cinematic history that was going to come as <laughs> the climax. But, like, that was another moment. Like, this movie is just, like, a ringer for awfulness. And that's another moment. It's like, imagine telling Emma Thompson, she is an Oscar winner. Imagine yep. putting in front of her an Oscar winner saying, please, Emma, say this line of dialogue. If I could find the hole, I would bleep her. Like, oh, my God. <laughs> like that just blows my mind like, like there's probably only like two people on this earth unfortunately Rob isn't one of them I am one of those two that is blown away by that <laughs> oh oh man yeah that's uh I've heard that phrase before I didn't find it the most funny I guess because I'm somewhat desensitized to it no, 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 but that's not desensitized of course we are we live in the modern age yeah, okay it's, yeah it's the fact that it's done in such a deadpan matter of the fact way possible like if 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 like let's say you had jock man like let's say you have the girl she's like shoving the cupcake in her mouth mm-hmm. and let's say we see like like okay how i try to fix book of henry let's say instead of a narrator you have jock man walks past her and one of jock man's friends says yo anorexia girl is looking pretty good ain't she and he's like yeah last year i would have said if i could have found the whole like if they did something like that like coming from uh, a teenager's yes. mouth that's like yes the, the line is, I'm not laughing, like, ha, 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 she's fat, ha, 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 I'm not laughing, that's not funny to me. It's funny that it's being said by an Oscar-winning actress in the most flat way possible. It's kind of like uh, Dean Norris during, like, the rape sequence, Naomi Watts interrupts during Book of Henry. It's like, <laughs> that scene's not, like, interrupting a rape is not funny, like, that's horrible. It's funny where, like, like she's doing that, and the character on the phone's like, yeah, uh-huh, you said uh-huh. that before, Susan. You said that before. Exactly. That's, it's, the, <laughs> it's the delivery that's funny. Not, not actually, it's like, no, I'm not laughing at the fact he was like overweight. That has nothing to do with it. Like Ansel Elgort's suicide. That's funny because it's shot like comically. And that, okay, that, but that's just one moment. Like I said, it's, it's not like, like, it's just, again, anyway, though. Yes, that's one. Okay, so we have one. Uh, Pretty what? Bitches Never Eat. Yes. So we've accomplished like three five. moments out of like 40. Yes. Um, the next one on my list we get a, a shot. It, it, the scene comes out of nowhere where it's a guy we've never seen standing in front of a classroom. Like it's the teacher and it's in classes in session. And the oh, first yeah. thing that happens is the guy writes <laughs> nine and then a, and then a slash and then an 11, but the, they're not on the same line. Like it really looks like the fraction nine yeah. over 11. Yeah. And he goes, <laughs> he, he like slams the marker down and goes, no, he's like, what does this mean? And he just, that's the action, he's, that's not a rhetorical question, he actually asks the class, what does this mean? And then one girl very timidly goes, it's the day the terrorists attacked, or something like that. And exactly. That was funny, that was, that was comical, is, because that's, I, and, I thought someone was going to say the fraction, I got some, someone was going to be like, 9 elevenths. <laughs> it's, and, and yes, and that's what it comes down to, the, the execution of this movie is just a complete and utter mess. Like if somebody gave me like the I, like gave me like all the 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 raw film of this and said make a coherent edit out of this, I think I could. I think I could make a better movie out of this or a more conventional movie. It's the fact like, like Rob says, like if you want, like, never mind. Think about what on earth does nine eleven have to do with this movie? Why even introduce that? You could pick any event in in world history or even U.S. history. He could say. Uh, December, I think about for the same reason he could put December 7th on the, he, he wrote December DEC period seven small upper hand TH. And so like, what is this, like, what does this mean to you? Yep. And like, I could deliver the line better. Yet this is a Hollywood movie and Jason Reitman could not get a decent uh, reading out of that actor. I would imagine <laughs> they did more than one take, or I hope they did more than one take. <laughs> And I think I remember Rob laughing at that moment. It is, it's a comical moment, and it has no payoff in the movie. Like they go to Adam Sandler and Adam Sandler's wife, and they're like, Where were you on 9-11? We were home. Yeah, Getting so they, they try work. and they try and make a sex joke. Like, you know, you never forget where you were when 9-11 happened and they were having sex, yeah. but they can't tell yeah. their kids. But so I actually this is an interesting thing uh that you brought up. So that it doesn't pay off. I agree with you that the, the whole fact of 9-11 being in this movie and that the kids have to do a project about it, that doesn't pay off. But it is clear to me 
which I think added to my hatred in this movie, uh, of this movie, that they tried to make it pay off. Because in that scene, when the kids are interviewing Adam Sandler and the wife, they, the, one of the kids says something like, like, how'd you know 9-11 happened? Did you get a text? And the parents say something along the lines of, well, no, we didn't really have cell phones back then. 9-11 is why we got cell phones. And that is actually oh. the case. Like, 9-11 changed the way the United States, like, dealt with 911 emergency services, and it changed our view on, on mobile communication. Yes, it changed but the way it, we, yes. Okay, only it's that. one line in the movie. If they had expanded on that a little bit more, it would have been better, but it's, a, it's one throwaway line. Yes, okay, I agree with you there. And I, and I think that's another example of the fact that I, I am not even looking at the movie that sort of, I, I, I didn't even think about that. I, that didn't yes. even register. By that point, Zach is just, like, waiting for his next fix of comedy. <laughs> at that point, Zach is just, yes, Zach is just like, like a junkie waiting <laughs> to start peeing his pants over something very subtle in the movie. Um, like, I, like I said, again, I have a very, I want people to know this too, I have a very specific sense of humor. I think I've told Rob this before, um, if I haven't told him before, I'm telling him now. I remember, like, like I, I'll interact with people for the first time, and like I'll make jokes, and like no, like, it doesn't blip on anybody's radar. And yet, like as time goes <laughs> on, like like six months, a year into like me working with the same people, like people I get familiar with, and people start like dying at my jokes. And I'm like, what? I tell people this, and it's gonna sound really narcissistic, but it's like once you get to once you get my sense of humor. I am absolutely hilarious because like, like Rob, like Rob has admitted to, it's like, why make the joke about like pushing the toddler into the Atlantic ocean or me screaming about nine 11 imagery in a Batman movie. It's like, once you get like what my sense of humor is, I am hilarious. But until you get to that point, you're going to think I'm just a weird guy who finds really things in bad taste. Hilarious. Literally my next bullet point is another funny moment in my notes. Okay. Adam Sandler is uh, on his son's computer yet again, looking at porn. While he's looking at porn, he decides to click on one of those banner ads for escorts. And I was like, well, duh, that's how he got viruses on the first computer. He's clicking on those ads. Um, but we get a scene where Adam Sandler has multiple drop-down boxes where he gets to choose the type of woman, the type of yes. prostitute that he wants to have and wants to like have service him. And one of the drop down boxes, of course, is breast appearance. And when he pulls this, when he clicks on this drop down box, <laughs> I think he picks like perky or something. Yeah. But one, one of the options is literally the word unattractive. <laughs> but just, it's like breast appearance, unattractive. It's, they have that option. <laughs> that, is such a, that is such I a know. subjective thing. Like, how, how could that be an option on a, on a wasn't, website? Like, wasn't there another one like saggy? I, I, there's oh, another, there's yeah, another. Saggy is on there, but that's not that's not a weird one. Saggy's on the actual porn site, Zach. Don't you know these things? I know, I know, but just like, <laughs> but again, like, okay, I made a comment back during our Batman vs Superman episode where I said, "Oh, Batman's decrypting the hard drive, and it's like zero percent, one point zero percent." Rob's like, "But that's how things work." I'm like, "Yeah, that's great, but it doesn't make for compelling cinema." <laughs> it's like, like if you have Adam, like the whole point is Adam Sandler's looking for, he's supposed to be looking for like escape. He wants something. Obviously, mm. he's he's done with like mundane, average. He's not that big of a pervert. He's not like looking up like really. He's not like like if his son was doing that. Like his son's like, and that's another plot point we're gonna get into in a moment because it has to be discussed because nerf football. But it's like, like, yes, if the son was doing that, that would make sense. But for Adam Sandler, you don't need that because Adam Sandler is looking for like. The most extreme version of like a perfect woman. He wants again perky boobs, uh, B to double Ds, uh, all these things. Like even I, I love his little hesitation. Do I want partially shaved or shaved? Hmm. <laughs> it's like like wh why even put that in the movie? All you need is for him to. He's looking at pornography that's not doing it for him anymore, and he graduates yeah. to the next level where he's mm -hmm. he's going from buying online por online porn to buying a prostitute to give him happiness or fulfillment like that's all you yeah. need like less is more oh yeah oh i totally agree uh but pff, we we got what we got zach <laughs> we, we, yes we, no, we got like, what we got <laughs> like, this is a mess. like i said and again it's a mess i concede that but, okay so i want to get to another scene i found absolutely hilarious okay where the judy greer and her daughter are walking through the mall and obviously everybody's texting judy greer's texting <laughs> and the daughter starts texting uh adam sandler's son 
who cannot get aroused unless he looks at the most absurd pornography possible. Yes. Much, I, think there's, I think there's an episode of South Park about that. That just shows Yo. you how... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's a scene in South Park where one of the characters has to look at the most extreme porn possible in order to get aroused. It's uh, Randy, it's, yeah, it's uh, Randy yes. Marsh. Think about that. This movie copies a plot point from South Park, which is one of the most <laughs> extreme forms of like over-the-top comedy there is right now in mainstream media. Like I said, let that sink in. Uh, and nobody said no to any of this. Nobody said no. Um, that's, that's the name this movie should have been. Nobody said no to this. Um, <laughs> Look what we got away with. <laughs> that's another title. That, that was the alternate title. The daughter's texting um, Jude, uh, Adam Sandler's son and says something. Like, she's trying to get like, again, she's, what would you call it? Like a very low-key sexting him. Like She's like asking him like all these provocative questions. Like, oh, watching football, does that equal porn? Yeah. Then, like, this, what this, would you do if I was tied up? He comes back eventually with, and they like full-on start sexting. Yes. And so, like, okay, that's going on, though. He leaves, like, the, the living room. Adam Sandler, like, watches him. Somehow he's cognizant of this conversation for some reason without any evidence whatsoever. Like, it's worth noting, the son has, like, the most deviant sexual fantasies, or I guess or I guess to get arousal, he needs sexual deviant fantasies. And yet that's never explored in the movie about how, like, it's worth saying that, like, Adam Sandler's entire family has, like, no character arc. Like, the only person that actually has, like, a character arc in this movie is Dean Norris, Judy Thankfully. Greer, and Jennifer Garner. Those are the only three characters that actually grow as characters over the course of the movie. Other than that, Adam Sandler's entire family is just stagnant and nothing is accomplished. <laughs> but no, yeah, and, he, and that's kind of the point at the end. Adam Sandler literally looks at the camera and is like, we're not going to do anything. <laughs> exactly. And this whole movie's about trying to like the whole end of the movie is the fact that we're trying like, it's like communication, how we interact with each other defines who we are as people and how it affects the future. And I and like I said, and, and Adam Sandler ends the movie with saying, "F all that, nothing matters." What Again, do you want in your eggs? Reason, yes. What do you want in your eggs? <laughs> uh, so okay, but anyway, the sun goes back up to the room, and he obviously is about to masturbate, and then as he he grabs a box of tissues. And then we cut back to Judy Greer and her daughter, and Judy Greer goes, "Oh, honey, look, they're doing a talent search." And we have like five minutes of like Judy Greer filling out paperwork, <laughs> and like this, and the daughter's getting like like uh, I don't want to say headshots, but, like glam shots taking off, yeah, obviously, yeah. for like a casting director. This is one before I get into the payoff of this scene. I find it extremely weird that they're having a a t like a, a talent search. I know Rob didn't like it why they're having a talent search in the middle of Texas, but this is the part that baffled me. If you look on the table where Judy Greer's filling out the paperwork, there's like 80 boxes of Chinese food. It's like, what What was this? Was this lunchtime? Like, <laughs> why is there 80? Like, if you look on that table, there's like like six or seven things of Chinese takeout. I did not this, catch this. It's like, what? I'm like, like again, but why is that there? Like, someone obviously from the prop, the prop department had to bring that there. Somebody had to request it. <laughs> Someone signed off on it. Yes. The and, thing that I caught in that scene was the uh, the talent agent says, like, and your daughter's going to need to write an essay. And Judy Greer <laughs> says she, Judy Greer says nothing but just looks at her daughter. And I thought that was hilarious. Like I said, that scene, like I said, but the, the greatest payoff of that scene is, like, so you, like, you have the sexting scene, and it cuts away to the daughter having the talent searching, which goes on for, like, what, four or five minutes. Mm -hmm. And, like, like Rob says, like, the, the recruiter says, oh, your daughter's going to have to, like, submit a video. She's going to have to write an essay. And then we'll let you know what happens. And it's like, oh, my God, Mom, I'm so excited. And, like, they, they go to walk away, and the little text message bubble shows up, and it says, I came. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> like, I started just applauding. I genuinely started applauding because I'm like, 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 how is that anything but hilarious? It's like, you know, like, like that texting, the sexting scene is over at that point. You've, you've moved on to another scene. And it's like, and, and it's implied the kid's going to masturbate. You show him with the tissues, boom, you <laughs> through visual imagery, through imagery, you've communicated that. And then you, ha it's like, how does it anything but create laughter? It's like, you're trying to make the audience laugh. But you're not even aware you're doing it, Jason Reitman. And it's like, again, that's another moment where Rob did not laugh at that. And I'm like, I did I, not. I, I did not. I, I lost I, I lost it. And I think that's what it is. Like, I'm look, like, much how Rob looks at the music, knows the, in, the music industry and how, like I said, I am like tone deaf. I don't understand the music industry. I think I have such a understanding of the film industry. So when something does not fall under the normal conventions, 
Like, not Eraser. Like, I'm not watching Eraser going, well, David Lynch, why isn't there any second act development of the plot of these characters? Like, no, like, I'm not looking at it like that, though. But this is a movie that's trying to be, much like Book of Henry, it's trying to be very conventional. It wa- Again, it, it's a movie that wants everybody going to look at it and saying, oh, wow, this is, it's trying to teach me something about being a good person, how we communicate with each other. And like, wow, Adam Sandler, like I said, it's trying to do that and it fails miserably. It does, it does. And I think, you know, we've said it again and we're in our, in our more fun stuff of this episode, but I, I agree with you there, Zach. And I think that's part of the reason, the fundamental reason why I not only uh, didn't care for this movie, but also why I didn't like Book of Henry as a late night movie, because they're trying to be something and failing. I, and as I think you would agree, I much prefer those things that are strange from creation. It's not an accident that it was strange. You would rather have an intentional, genuine masterpiece than me or I, who would rather have a cynical, unintentional, or I guess a masterpiece through just being cynical and loving something that fails. Yes, and, and I think that that goes kind of to the roots of what the two of us are looking for. I'm not saying this is absolute. You know, there can be some, some you know, uh, happy mistakes, lightning in a bottle, you know, that type of stuff. We haven't encountered it yet on Cinemodities, but I am much more for that intentional masterpiece. That's a good way to put it. Well, we have the Professor Xavier and the Magneto. Yeah, uh, so uh, I guess it's up to the viewers. Uh, my big thing has been how do we split a tie if we don't agree on a movie? Zach says we don't need to split a tie. Cage match. I, I cage guess match that's okay. But, you know, I, if people listen to this, I think they're going to have to pick one of us to be the favorite and one of us to be the hatred. You know, like Team Edward, Team Jacob. Yes. Team, team Rob or team, team Zach. And if you're Team Rob, don't watch Book of Henry late at night. If you're Team Zach, you do. And that's that's fair. I, I can get behind that. I think at the very least, I think Rob can admit this. Watch it for experience. I think it would go for any movie, even because we haven't really established anything where I would say outright no. I think you just have to experience it. You I know, think- that's something that we can completely agree on. Zach and I can 100% say for certain, watch it. Like, watch never everything. just throw something away. Always experience it. That's important. Thanks. We have gotten, in, in my, on my notes to my favorite part of the movie, my funniest, it really is my favorite part, the funniest part, everything is the best part of the movie. And it is the scene uh, where the anorexic girl has the abortion, or the like, <laughs> the, the involuntary abortion, like her body aborts the baby. Because she's anorexic, maybe, they kind of try, try and tie it together. But uh, the anorexic girl wakes up in the hospital, and her parents... Are sit are like sitting next to her bed. Who's and her father? Who's her father? That's exactly what I'm about to say. Her dad is played by another actor that we are going to have to do a series on in Cinemodities, J.K. Simmons. Yeah, one of the greatest actors ever. One of the greatest people ever. Also, uh, he plays. He's in two scenes of this movie. He he's actually the one who torments her with the shepherd pie earlier on. We didn't yes. mention that. Um, but he is sitting there. Worried about his daughter. Very worried. The daughter wakes up. They start talking. Oh, my God, what happened? The doctor comes in. Doctor says in, like, the calmest, most professional voice, you know, I'm going to tell you some things. Your daughter's okay, but, you know, they're, they're pretty heavy. I'm going to tell you these things right now. Uh, it was no Lee Pace from Book no. of Henry. Uh, it was no Dr. House either. Lee Majors. Lee Majors, yeah. <laughs> and and so the doctor says to the parents that, you know, you had a, an, what was it, a, an, an ectopic pregnancy or something like that like her body couldn't handle the baby so it expelled it and her body like forced herself to have a miscarriage and the mother i'm pretty sure this is how it goes down the mother says you were pregnant and then no 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 sorry sorry jk simmons looks at the daughter and goes you were pregnant the daughter goes daddy and jk simmons with no hesitation immediately goes don't daddy me (laughs) You, what, you were pregnant? How can that even happen? I'm sorry, Daddy. Don't Daddy me. Most important thing to remember. Great. Best line in the movie. 100%. The greatest part of the movie. J.K. Simmons screaming at his daughter in the hospital. Don't Daddy me. Okay. Okay. This The whole anorexic girl sex scene. Like this. this I could write a thesis on this. 
Um, this, this, this you're, going so back, much... you're going back to the sex scene? Yes, yes. Because, okay, what, about is, the, okay. what about the Don't Daddy V scene? We're getting there. Zach has to make me walk through, like, yes. You need context. I love the final point. I am a connoisseur of context. You need the context. You need to build everything up before you have to pay off. I like that nickname for you, the connoisseur, connoisseur of, context. of context. That's on That's top cool. of the. When am I? When am I? I'm late on the Lego Maniac. What's your no, name? No, I don't know where that. You're the Snack Master. I don't know where Lego on the, Maniac. On the Snack from. Master, the Lego Maniac, no, and the Connoisseur of Context. About, you've never talked about Lego on this. You're not it the Lego Maniac. Sh- it's a mystery. <laughs> We're gonna pay off. Like in four <laughs> seasons, we'll finally get to that. Everyone will be so disappointed that it goes nowhere. <laughs> sex scene. Yeah, that's interact sex scene. Okay, <laughs> this scene is another moment in the film which I think you could write eons about because. The scene begins with they walk into like one of the friends' house and Jock Man is sitting on the couch playing. Rob didn't know if it was Rob audibly made the comment that what is that? It's not Guitar Hero or it's not Rockman. You know what that was, right? Rock is it Rock Smith? Yep, that was the game that taught you how to play guitar. Yes, I looked it up later on uh, because I was so confused as to what they were doing. I was yelling. Actually, this is where I really wish I had my commentary. I really should have, even if nobody ever listened to it, I should, maybe like five years from now, I could have given that to you. And you'd be like, oh, that's why. Okay, so I might do my own commentary for this. I need laughing at everything. <laughs> no, I a, never want to watch this again. No, you're being forced to watch it again. Um, anyway, though. And so, can, okay, I, can, so, I make, can I give the history plug real quick? Please do. About Guitar Hero. I'm going to do it real quick, Zach. I am really, really good at Guitar Hero. And that has never changed. Zach and I have not played Guitar Hero together for years, but Zach, it has never changed. No. So the timeline of this, I'm utterly fascinated, much like Inception, where people try to break down the time period of each dream sequence. I think you could do the exact same thing to this moment in the film. So Anorexic Girl walks into the house, sees Jock Man playing not Guitar Hero, and the uh, Anorexic Girl and her friend and the guy who I can't tell if they're if he's gay or if they're boyfriend and girlfriend, I, I can't tell that. But that's another mystery of this film. It's kind of like <laughs> it, it's another like I'm like if only I knew what was going on there. And so she she sees the fact that Jock Man's out there. And she goes, "Okay, guys, I have to go use the bathroom." She walks out of the bedroom, doesn't shut the door to the bedroom, goes to the bathroom door, which is literally right across the hallway, opens the door and then closes it, trying to. <laughs> Fake that she went into the bathroom. She then proceeds to go into the living room, stands in the threshold of the living room, and says, and is very awkward with Jockman, like, hey, how you doing? And he's like, just sit down. And so she goes and sits down. <laughs> and she's like, she's like, wow. Like, she's just sitting there. He's like, wow, you lost a lot of weight. And she's like, yeah, I, st- I watched what I ate. There's like, like two minutes of just awkward silence. Next thing we know, they're in a bedroom, not the same bedroom that her friends are in but another bedroom, and he's, like, kissing her, and they're disrobing. And during this whole thing, she's, like, she's like a little hesitant, and he's, like, I don't want to be a rapist or whatever, so do whatever you want. Wait, um, should we, like... Oh, yeah, so, uh, the first time, it's gonna hurt a little bit, but it's just something you kind of have to do to get it over with. You know what I'm saying? Right, um... Maybe we should just, like, you know... Okay, look, we can stop if you want, but eventually you're going to have to do it. I'm not, like, a rapist or some shit, so... Okay. No, no, it's okay. Yeah. He's obviously peer pressure, and he's like, "You're gonna have to get get it over with eventually, so you might as well oh, yeah, do it, it now." It is the it is the slimiest, scummiest line of dialogue in the whole yes. movie. Where he's it made, like, it, "It's icky." It's, he's it's like, icky. "You're gonna have to do it eventually," and and I'm not a rapist or anything, so yeah. and he starts putting his pants back on, and you're yeah. like, "Holy shit!" Yeah, not cool, not cool. But so she's like, like she already has her top off, and she's like. And like he's about to pull his pants up, and she's like, "No, no, just go ahead, just go ahead." And next, like Rob said, there is no for a movie that has such sexual themat- like themes in it. There is no sex in this movie. The only really sex we get is we see like Adam, we don't even see it, but we see Adam Sandler like cuddling with a prostitute, and then we see like Adam Sandler having sex with his wife, and you see the bed rocking. You don't even see you don't even know there's people on the bed. 
No, honestly, I'm, someone could have dropped a bowling ball on the bed for a couple of seconds. I am like, glad you, you brought this up, Zach, because wait, wait, actually... Wait, 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 wait. Let me finish the anorexic sex, okay. sex scene. Okay. So after that happens, she has she has sex with Jockman. Jockman walks out of the bedroom, or, or not even that. They have, like, she says, okay. She says, okay. Cut to the very next scene. We see her walking in front of the bathroom, opening and closing the door, <laughs> yes. and then going back to her friends. <laughs> yes. It's like... How much time did this take? Was she in the bath? I, I get it. It's her first time having sex. It's not going to last more than like like two minutes. Like I get that though. But considering that so much went on before that, it's like how long was she supposed to be in the bath for? And you're telling me her friends did not hear any of this? And like, she fooled them by pretending she was in the bathroom? I'm like, movie, come on. <laughs> We're better than that. It's because you don't value yourself. You got to value us a little bit more. I agree that I noticed that as well. It was it was kind of nonsensical. I I thought she, when she like after they have sex and she opens the bathroom door, I thought she was actually going to go into the bathroom to you know do post post coitus things like watch Fantastic Planet. Yeah, but but she didn't. She was just like, I need to fake my friends out again, and I was like, they're going to notice. They could probably see her from where they're sitting in the in the in the room, right? <laughs> Never mind they heard her and they knew she did not go into the bathroom and they saw that she didn't go into the bathroom at all during this like 2 to like 4 hour time span. Yeah, it's the, it's a nightmare. The only thing that would make that scene better is if they changed the lighting of the scene cuz like obviously they're come like they're walking in the house at like like mid afternoon that it was like dark by the time she walks back into the bedroom. That's the only <laughs> thing they could do to make that scene even funnier. <laughs> that, would, that would be great. A complete lighting shift. And she closes the bathroom door. Like she's been in the bathroom for like six hours. The parents like, okay. come home, they start making dinner. There's people like talking and having a good time in the living room and, and they, they come out and they're like, what? <laughs> <laughs> How long were we watching Breaking Amish for? <laughs> <laughs> oh no! But you brought up a good point in there, um, which is on my note. My notes as well. I don't think they ever show two people in the act of having sex on camera. We only get that sex is implied, right? Yeah, it, 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 it's implied. There's never any sort of. Um, like sexual content or simulated mm -hmm. sex, nothing of that. Which again, like I said, is weird considering that this is like that's like one of the major themes of the film. I did find that really, really strange. And the only time we get a shot of like two people's, uh, you know, torsos and their heads and one and they're on top of each other, like they're gonna have sex, is the is the sex scene between Adam Sandler's son and the girl who has Judy Greer's daughter. Mm -hmm. But that's not a sex scene. Like they fail to have sex. Yes. So, so, you know, that's the one thing I was thinking, oh, are they showing two people having sex, but they're not. So the movie never does it. But wait, I'm trying to think, does, does Adam Sandler's wife have sex? Because she's like, at one point with the Allstate guy, she's like, I, wanna, I, I want your, your big meaty cock. And, she, and she's <laughs> like, and it's like and she, I'm not sure if she's just like uh, thrusting on him or if it's actual penetration going oh on? it's just that's just thrusting that's definitely just thrusting that's there's no okay just make i sure. was paying okay. attention to this act with the, okay, with the fucking sure. all-state guy i've never seen the all-state guy in a sex act before so i was no. quite intrigued and everybody <laughs> comes out of nowhere in the movie he's just like like it, you think considering the fact that the all-state guy who um okay i gotta find out what's okay i, I know his name if i saw it, i just gotta find it. no he doesn't have a name he's mr all-state no that's racist that, what? Dennis Haber. Dennis Haber. Okay, yeah, no, Dennis Haber. Like, Dennis that's Haber, racist, Zach. Yeah, that's racist. <laughs> Dennis Haber is a legitimate actor. Like, yes, he's the Allstate guy because of his voice, how iconic his voice is, though. But, like, he is a legitimate actor. So, okay. like, you'd think having him in your movie, you'd want to build, not build him up, be like, oh, he just shows up. And I think the movie's even trying to have, like, a shock moment. Because like, like Adam Sandler's going to ho goes to the hotel bar. She gets a hotel room, like gets dressed up in her hotel room, then goes down to the bar, and she's waiting at the bar, kind of like looking over her shoulder, like doesn't know. And then out of the blue, we see a black man's hand go for her back. It and is. I think it the is the first black person we see in the movie. Yes. I think now that I think about it. 
Exactly. And I think the movie is trying to make that a shock moment. Like, oh, she's having an affair with a black man. I like, never I think, thought about that. I think the movie is trying to do that. Like, it's like, again, 2014, progressive filmmaker, and, and they're trying to make the fact that a white woman is having an affair with a black man. Like, it's not, it's no, it's not explicit at all. Yeah, that, that makes me hate this movie more, because I agree with you. I didn't see it that way, but now I totally do. Like, they were going for a shock value. Exactly. Now, that's again, terrible! And that's why this movie, okay, Rob thinks that's terrible. I find that utterly fascinating. Kind of like how we look back at, like, Birth of a Nation, and we go, like, most, most people are horrified by that. I'm amazed that it's a culture, I'm amazed by it in the sense that it's a cultural oddity. And that people actually <laughs> fought this at some point in their life. And even though Birth of a Nation was made like in the early 20th century, this was made in 2014. And yep. nobody said no. Nobody said, let's take a step back from this and rethink. It. Wow. Wow. Uh-huh. Wow. Man. Okay, I I'm, I'm I have I have I now have a worse opinion of this movie than when we started. I think that <laughs> oh, you have you, your efforts have sent me in the opposite direction. Oh. So I would I would like to I would like to say at this point, can we shift gears a little bit and talk about something that we can both agree on and that we we probably should talk about and it's Dean Norris. Since this is the Dean Norris series, how about we describe Dean Norris's role in this movie? <laughs> nah. I think the Dean Norris subplot is probably the only cut. I don't even want to say normal because it's not normal. Well, you want to you want to talk about his role in this movie? No, I was going to say because Dean Norris has probably the most normal and conventional plot in this he's the only he's one of the very few characters that has an actual character arc that's true he uh so dean norris you're great i know you're listening to this because it's a series about you you're catching every episode as they come out you're great in this movie you're probably the best part of this movie uh you have a great arc he plays a dad his wife left him and his son alone he's trying to raise his son he overreacts in because of stuff that's going on in his own life. He's trying to date Judy Greer, but she's like uh, peddling child porn to some extent. <laughs> and he doesn't want to get involved with that, and he overreacts with his son, and his son tries to commit suicide, and he sees the error of his ways. He's a great part. He is a great part of this movie. He's Dean Norris. He can't be bad. No. But Zach, I want to I talk about where does this Dean Norris arc take place in the Dean Norris movie structure because we all know that he fakes his death at the end of Book of Henry but the question is does he go right from Glenn Sickleman into Kent Mooney raising this child do you have an opinion on this Zach um I, I to be fair I'm not limber enough or uh, <laughs> uh agile enough to do the mental gymnastics that are required for such maneuvering into connecting all these films together so I'm gonna <laughs> leave it up to your expertise Okay, so this these are not consecutive, and the audience should be aware of this. We are not doing this series in consecutive order of of Dean Norris's kind of, you know, life, because that's what we're following. Dean Norris lives through all these these lives, and he does certain things, and he has to jump between them all. And we know what happened in Book of Henry. He had to fake his own death so we could get out of there because he was getting uh, nailed for abusing Maddie Ziegler. But the, he doesn't go right to being Kent Mooney. This is something we're not going to talk about for a little bit, but immediately after Book of Henry, uh, he becomes Mazimo, the Purple Pegasus, and Sophia the First. That's the next thing that happens. So this movie, Men, Women, and Children, this is actually late in Dean Norris's career, I think, or in Dean Norris's, you know, traveling universe mythology. I think this is pretty far along because, you know, he had a wife, he had a kid with that woman. The wife had to leave him. So I think I'm going to defer this for the time being. The audience who's keeping up with this series, uh, we have Book of Henry. That's kind of a point that's floating right now. He's going to go to Sophia the First. We're going to talk about that. But way in the future, that's when we get Kent Mooney from Men, Women, and Children. So this is going to come back. We're going to come back to this later on when we get to the thing that's right before Men, Women, and Children, which is Gremlins 2. Can you handle that, Zach? 
I don't know about you, audience, but for like a solid like two minutes, all I heard was the X Files theme again. It's this really weird phenomenon that happens with this podcast. Like Rob starts talking about all this, and it's just like a solid three minutes of the theme. It's not even like jarring; it just loops. Like I don't even know where it ends. To be completely honest with you. But going back to Dean Norris's character arc, like there's only three characters in this film that have a genuine character arc: Dean Norris, Judy Greer, yes, and I, and I think this character has the most massive character arc. Jennifer Garner, who I'm shocked we have not mentioned in this, considering how anal she is about like cybersecurity and like protecting her daughter online. Uh, Jennifer like, Garner plays the character that if I met in real life, I would seek out conflict with. There are certain people that I disagree with to such a such a great extent that I feel they need to hear a counterpoint. Like there's people like Jennifer Garner who are so Jennifer Garner in this movie, who are so set in their ways that they can't even comprehend a counterpoint. They need it forced into their face. I hated her character, Zach. I abhorred her in this movie. But the problem is that she's such a generic character. We've seen this character a million times. She's the -the over-the-top helicopter parent that just is constantly up their kid's ass to an absurd extent. To the point where, like, her daughter leaves a a zone on the GPS tracking, and she gets an immediate alert. It's like zones? It's like you've actually spent the time getting software that zones out the neighborhood? Like, (laughs) that's another thing in this movie. It's like... Why instead of having a moment like that, and you know the moment, it shows like a little bleeping dot that's like, like that's her daughter. Yep. She goes and visits Ansel Elgort at home after he like beats the snot out of a kid for throwing an yeah. orange at his girlfriend. And it's like it's like tracker change zone. And I'm like, what? So like, why that, not does, just... that doesn't happen. We the world does not have technology that accurate. That's just no, or at least not consumer grade for parents to monitor their children. The government probably has the ability to do I've, that. Uh, they're trying to get that ability. That's that's where we are right now. They but, don't. That is literally a science fiction aspect right now. See, there's another thing that film. This film is a bad science fiction film. On top of that, <laughs> but it's like why not? Okay, going back and trying to make this movie at least a little bit more. Uh, down to earth why not have a scene while she does that like a car drives by and and it's her father because i know at one point you see jennifer garner with her man you're like who the hell is this guy i am so glad this this is my question for you zach it it goes stranger who lives in the garner household it goes it goes with what you're saying it's not an interjection i said it in my commentary i wrote it in my notes i even looked at the timestamp when i was making these notes at an hour and seven minutes into this movie Jennifer Garner just starts talking to a random man in her house. And Zach, I want to know, did I forget that she had a husband, or do they really drop him on us that late into the game? There's no explanation. In all, at one point, I thought, if it wasn't for the fact that they sleep in the same bed, I, when I first, when I rewatched it the second time, or I'm sorry, when I rewatched it the initial time after like three years ago, I thought maybe it was her brother, because it's not established. Because like you, because you never hear the daughter call him dad. Like you never hear like 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 if there was a point in the film where like she's like a like Jennifer Garner's like on her computer and it's like some guy called you hot H A W T and she should have been like oh dad says it's innocent like that would have been fine like like a bit of throwaway dialogue establishes that, that there is a father. I don't think they even interact, right? They don't. I don't think they share a scene together. What the fuck? Like that's and that's why if it wasn't for the fact that they're sleeping in the same bed together, I would think it's her brother or it's like someone or maybe it's her cousin that just like, I, like again, maybe showing that there is a diverse thing in this country where like it's not just always uh, mother, father, child or children. Mm-hmm. Like there are like other people again. Like you like and that would also give a new perspective in communication. Like we communicate with like we have family members who are like are distant or maybe maybe it's a coworker. Maybe he. Maybe he got cheated on by like a spouse. Maybe he got thrown out of his house. Again, another aspect of just how we yeah. interact with people. Like, no, it's her husband, and it's never established. Again, could it be a stepfather? Could it be? It's just like you said. It's literally just thrown at us. And really, the only thing he had, he has a slight moment where he provides a minuscule moment of bounce back from Jennifer Garner. He says, "Let her be a teenager for once." And that's he also it. says, "He also says, come on, Top Chef is coming on." <laughs> when she when she's about to read all her like internet history, but then the husband's like, oh. "Come on, Top Chef's coming on." Okay, I, I know we didn't want to do plot point by plot point, but we finished Jennifer Gardner. But has a question about that that 
family too. Okay, so Jennifer Garner has the major character arc where she goes from being like completely like anal retentive about spying on her daughter until once she's realized what she did to Ansel Elgort, that she turns it all off. She shuts the she shuts the tracking system. She goes complete and anti NSA and shuts it all down. She yes. goes Edward Snowden on us, <laughs> and that's the ending of the movie. But going back to a point though, is that the her daughter has like. Uh, what would you even call it? Like a an a, an online alias, like an alias, or well, uh, well, I mean, I don't, know, I don't know how much you want to get into this, but the actual daughter was trying to portray herself in the way that her mother wouldn't let her in on Instagram. Is but that the, what it is? That that's how I took what the daughter was doing. But the movie leads you to believe that she is somehow doing this and getting around the the tracker that Jennifer yeah. Garner has on place, she would need a whole another internet account. Like you yeah. can't do this if, if you're on if Jennifer if she was doing this on Jennifer Garner's internet, there it would not be invisible. Which it isn't because she like sees it at the end. Jennifer Garner finds out that she's doing this, but it's like invisible for some amount of time. Well that's why okay this is my question because at one point in the movie because, like I said, only three characters have character arcs. None of the children have character arcs. All no, the children not at all. begin and end in the same exact place, except for maybe Adam Sandler's son, who can't get aroused by anything. Because we don't even see his thing resolved. Like, uh, Judy Green's daughter all. confronts him and is like, you have a problem, some serious issues, and she walks away. And we have, like, it, the camera holds on him for about, like, three seconds. And you can, t- you can see that he's grasping with this. But yes. we never get any resolution to it. Maybe we'll get a sequel about the children in, like, 25 years. <laughs> Just children, children, and children? <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, no, it's men, women, and their children. But, anyway, though, so you go back to this, and you have the daughter. And she's like, again, she, she can't do anything. In the, uh, the first scene we see with her, she's pulling, she has, like, a SIM card key, and is pulling the SIM card out of her phone and putting in a, an alternate in the SIM, uh, in the phone, so she can, I guess, make phone calls and her mother does not know about it when she's not yes, at home. Yes, that's that's the that's what I got. Yes. Well, okay. So you have that. So again, that's at least uh, competent filmmaking. Like I understood it. Like okay, I don't get how anybody under the age or over the age of thirty gets that, but I get that. Mm-hmm. So you okay? Excuse me. Maybe forty over the age of forty. I don't get anyone over the age of. You try <laughs> explaining a SIM card to someone over the age of forty. They're like, what? I make <laughs> phone calls. It's like what? What? So you have that. And then at one point in the movie, you have her. She goes into her closet, like takes out like a a tote or like a Tupperware of like stuffed animals and like sweaters, and she pulls out like a pink wig. And the camera cuts away, and there's no explanation to it. It's this. It's this. It's the setup. It's yeah, yeah. The, it's the yeah. taste of it. For the record, Rob is doing very large air quotes into the camera. I'm using I, my I, whole arms for air quotes. quotes. <laughs> and then, and then it's never explained again until. She's like hanging out with Ansel Elgort, who is literally sleepwalking through this movie. I'm pretty sure through most of the scenes of this movie, his eyes are closed. And then she says, I have this secret Tumblr account. I don't even know, I don't remember the exact language she uses, but she's like, This is I have this Tumblr account where I'm able to like act out the way I feel. Mm -hmm. And again, and she drops it. He doesn't ask any questions about this. He is a bad boyfriend. He doesn't ask any questions. Yeah, he he goes on to talk about his own problems. Yes. And then like 15 minutes later, we see him online and he's look and we have no at this point we never see her in the outfit. We just see like we see some like like very close up like we see her like with like we see like a putting like, on extreme, lipstick. Yeah, like that's it. And you see like a close up of like her lips and like the very bottom of the wig. Mm-hmm. And that's it. And then like 15 20 minutes later or maybe even longer, maybe like 40 minutes later, we see him looking at like a Tumblr page or like like a blog. And it's obviously his girlfriend with the pink wig and like the black tutu. But like it's never explained why she does this other than being some sort of very passive form of acting out against her mother's wishes. And then Mm -hmm. as Rob said, then like another 20 minutes later, because this is a two hour long movie, Jennifer Garner is about to sit down on the couch with her husband, brother, cousin lover. And it's like (laughs) it has like, like like, like a stack of like. 
40 pa- like pages of paper, like binder clipped together. Not even stapled, because it's too thick to be stapled. And he's like, honey, put that down. Top Chef is on. And she puts it down, and it's like, oh. Like, and there's no explanation. It's like, why? Like, there's no like hinting of what this piece of paper's for. It could be about literally anything. Like The first time, the second time I watched it, I thought she was going to find out about the Judy Greer um, child pornography. Oh. And then, like, that would connect it to her. And then Dean Norris would get involved. And, you, like, you would tell, because think about it, none of these stories tie in together. It's like they, Ansel no, they're Elgort. They're all loosely connected. Very loosely connected. Like, through, like, like Ansel, like, uh, Dean Norris talks to Adam Sandler at the football game. And then Dean Norris goes to, like, Jennifer Garner's, like, parent internet class PTA mm. meeting. That then, that's how he meets Judy Greer. And, like, it's, like, again, very loosely connected. Like, none of the kids have anything to do with each other. And so you have all that. Then we see her with, the, like, the paper. It's like, what is this about? And then, like, 15 minutes later, she's looking at the paper. And, like, Jennifer Garner blows up, goes to her daughter's computer, and just literally takes the entire desktop and just comically delete. Like, this takes everything. <laughs> Little does Jennifer Garner know by deleting all the icons on the desktop. It does not delete every file on don't, the computer. Don't I uh, say that in my commentary? I don't I'm, remember, but I, I, I think I, I would say be surprised something if like, did. I'm like, oh, you just deleted a bunch of shortcuts, like maybe three <laughs> files or something like that. <laughs> it is. It's like again, whatever. And so, like, if we saw her, like, 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 we all know, like, with iPhones or like smart devices, like, there's like a button, it's like del- erase all data from this computer. Confirm yes. Are you sure? Yes. That's all you needed to do, and that would have said it all. But no. And then we have this, and so the daughter comes home, and she like flips out. Like, like, I can't believe you did this to me, blah, 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 blah. At no point does Jennifer Garner's character say, honey, why do you feel that the only way you can express yourself is, like, pretending to be a pink-haired burlesque dancer on Tumblr? Like, yes. at no point. Like, again, for a movie about communication, there is no, communi- no rational communication. Yes. That gets back to my point way back when now of why I really disliked this movie, the big <laughs> ending message. Not everyone in the world is a fucking moron like the people this movie follows. There is more to life than what these characters think life is. And that's, and I think that's the big thing. When you watch this movie, if, if you watch this movie, if for some reason this is, you have to sit through all, you, you've done this before, Zach. If we're using a Batman versus Superman as a unit length of time, this is 18 Batman versus Supermans. Oh no. If you if you for some reason have to sit through all of this, remember that at the end of this movie, this is not what life is. We are not this bad off. Remember that, audience. We're better than what this movie makes us out to be. I I I, I get behind that. Yeah, you know, good. I don't... You should because because humans are better than just oh who are we fucking? We're way better than that. To be fair, though, I don't I don't relate to these characters any more on a human level than why I do when I read Family Circus in the Sunday newspaper. They are That's like beyond on. caricatures of the human experience. <laughs> I think Rob, I think Rob might actually, you know, he hates this movie. He might actually value it more as a piece of existence than I do because he actually is giving it credit for failing at real human things or I, I refuse to even acknowledge it at that level. So in a weird way, Rob might value this more than I do. I think he does. He might hate it, but in order to hate something, you have to at least care about it or at least value it as something. Now I don't even, this, I reject it at that level. This is where we should be playing the X-Files music because <laughs> that's a conspiracy. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I no. think I think uh, unless you have more to add, I think I have said everything I can say about this within a reasonable oh, well, amount look of time. At that. Zach, Zach and I are hitting a stride because there's no editing or anything. Literally, the thing that I was about to say say that I stopped to let Zach say what he was about to say is the same thing. Whoa. There's no point in talking about this nonsense anymore. We need to get to the real question. Everybody knows anyone who's made it through the however long what uh six batman versus supermans that's the length this no. episode has been so far my goal uh, is to have this episode be the exact runtime of men women and children so, <laughs> so you we can use this as, as so you can run this as a commentary as you're watching the film so we have to have this exactly down to like an hour and like 55 minutes <laughs> oh jesus okay well then let's ask the the real question oh, the wait question. wait one more thing one what more am thing. i waiting for one more thing no I have a theory. Cue the X-Files music. What do you think this movie is rated? Oh, 
<laughs> like rating, like 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 MPAA rating. What do you think it's rating? You, I didn't think of that at all. I'm gonna guess PG thirteen. No, it's rated R. I, I wish I could have this picture of what the face is. Yes, it's radar. Why? This is theory. I did not know this until when we started recording, and I just looked it up. Well, this is my this is my theory. I, I think this is what. Yes, radar. What? And I, th- I think the reason why it's okay. I gotta look up the exact rating why because they, they put it like on the posters. But I think the reason why it's radar. I think when Jason Reitman went to make this movie, he expected to probably get a PG thirteen rating. He probably expected that. And I think there was even a a push to to I think there were people like Rob probably knows. Like there'll be a time, like there'll be like a movie like uh there'll be some like important like art not art film, but like a movie with a message and it'll get an art an R rating and people be like, no, this should be rated PG or PG thirteen so the people who it's meant for can actually go see it. Yeah. And I think this was one of those movies during the fall of twenty fourteen that like people were saying you need it shouldn't be rated that high. Oh, you're gonna love this. Oh, 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 oh. Okay, I want Rob the brace himself. Are you sitting I'm, down, I'm, Rob? I'm gripping the table. Here we go. Rated R for strong sexual content, including graphic dialogue throughout, sure. some involving teens and for language. <laughs> so I think what, what happened was he was trying to make an R-rated movie. Or, I'm sorry, a PG-13 movie. And then when he submitted this to the MPAA, the Motion Picture Association of America, and they said, your topic is inherently connected to child pornography and explicit sexual dialogue amongst teenagers, you cannot get anything less than that. I think he was trying to make like a feature length PSA about like the follies of today with technology amongst adults and children, obviously men, women, and children. And I think the MPAA threw a wrench into the middle of that. You know what? I I I, uh, I should have thought about that when I guessed at a rating before. Uh, you know, it's never the word child pornography or the word pedophile is never used in this movie, but it is strongly suggested that what Judy Greer is doing is child pornography. Yes, that that I would imagine warrants an R rating to this committee. Yeah, and that's and I think that's what happened to him is that he figured okay i'm trying to say something negative about this i'm saying why this is wrong but because it's just because it's there it has to have that rating and i think that's what threw a wrench into this for him i think once that happened he might have just went completely overboard you know what no one's with an r rating nobody's gonna see this no adult is gonna pay money for this so let's make less people see it <laughs> well it's like, it's like you know what let's just go balls to the wall and say yeah it's worth I'm- noting on the poster there is a hashtag a oh. specific head. hashtag MWC. So oh. if you want to rep your, your men, women, oh. and children love, much like me, it's an Octothorpe. hashtag MWC. I prefer Octothorpe. I didn't want. I wasn't going to bring this up, but um, but since we're talking about the scene, uh, there is a culmination in which Judy Greer says to her daughter, "We can't do child pornography anymore." And Judy Greer basically says, they're right, you know, we can't sell pictures of you on the internet. You can do whatever you want, but not that. And the daughter goes, no, that's what I want to do. And Judy Greer says, you're better than that website. And the daughter comes back with, no, I'm not. Honey, they didn't like our website. Well, then screw them. I thought about it. And they're right. I took down the site. You what? What about all of my fans? If you want to act, you can act. We will get you into every theater program that we can. But that show and the website, that's not what you want to do. Yes, it is. Mom, it is. It's everything that I want to do. You're better than that stupid show. And you're better than the website. No, you have to put it back up. I can't. Yes, you can. Just push a fucking button. I've allowed you certain flexibility, but right now, I have to be your mom. No, you're being a selfish bitch. <laughs> <laughs> just bla- just very bluntly, like, I want to be a porn star! <laughs> the real question that we have on Cinemodities, as we described, as we've been talking about, do we add this? 
to the late night movies canon. If you have someone in your clutches and you have the opportunity to show them a movie, length aside, we're not putting any time restrictions. We are putting an indefinite period on this. Do you show them men, women, and children? Zach, can you take a guess at what my answer is? <laughs> I'm going to imagine it rhymes with schmo. This, I didn't think it could happen, but this is a no that is harder than the no for Batman versus Superman. What a waste. What a waste. <laughs> I mean, I don't think I even need much more explanation. I disagree with the mo- this movie. Um, it's funny at parts, but it's it doesn't do enough to hook you. It doesn't do enough to make it worthy of using a night for it. When I think of late night movies, I think of, you know, you have an, one opportunity to play a movie for this person or this group of people. I do not want to use it on men, women, and children. No matter if these people have seen every other movie we've talked about, every other movie we will talk about, this is not on the queue. Okay. And <laughs> I, okay. And, okay, Rob, Rob's going to love this. I could not be more opposed. I would say this is a a cinemon. Okay, Rob, would you concede this is a cinemon? Oh, this is bizarre filmmaking. You might oh. not agree that's a late night. I know you conceded in Book of Henry that that was a cinemon, but it did not make the late night movies list. This would you give this? Is this also a cinemon? This is a this is a begrudging cinemonity. For how much I hate this movie, how much I don't want to even have it in my sphere. Zach, I will tell you that you have you have succeeded in one respect. You have convinced me that this is a cinemodity. Okay. Okay, so Rob agrees cinemodity. Rob doesn't feel it's a late night movie. It he is. It me. is so out there. It is so off the walls. Yeah. I gotta give that to you. Yep. Okay, thank you. Okay. Rob doesn't agree it's a late night movie. He gives a harder no than Batman versus Superman, which I I can't fathom that. <laughs> Batman versus Superman is miserable. This is a a joy ride through insanity, but I am the other way. I would say I would definitely like if I had a short list, this would be up there. I don't think it's as jarring as an eraser head. I don't think I think it's something you could put on. People again, nobody might. I think it's at the same time. I don't think anybody can enjoy this movie. So I'm being selfish and saying I would put it on my late night movie canon. But I think considering the fact that I am only one that's ever going to see my late night movie canon. <laughs> so it's it's mine, so I'm going to put it on there. And I would go on to say that if I had to pick a Hall of Fame with, like, a racer head, I would put this, this. This is a Hall of Famer for me. Wow. This, I would say this is a – okay, there's going to be a term I'm going to use numerous times throughout this podcast. Sure. Um, I, there's the term slam dunk. A racer head is a slam dunk. Okay. For me, men, women, and children is a slam dunk. Like, if, if somebody said, recommend best worst movies, I would put The Room, I would put Book of Henry, and I would recommend on top of that, much like how I did The Raw, but maybe now I've learned I maybe have to tweak that recommendation and say, this movie is not for anyone. Like, it's hard. <laughs> it's it's not a movie for any for everyone. It's hardly a movie for anyone. I like that, and I, yes. And I think that's what I would have to do. I would, But I would say this is a definite Hall of Fame. But I'm wow. gonna add a ca- I'm gonna put a, a caveat at the end of that, saying that while I originally watched this from the library three years ago, I did not remember a thing about it. All I knew was if it wasn't for this podcast, I probably wouldn't have revisited it because I wouldn't have thought of it. I just got lucky and looked at it on the shelf at the right time and it just clicked. So like I said, it took two it took three years for me to go back and revisit it, and I saw it as the unintentional comedic masterpiece that it is so maybe um, maybe in 2021 rob will come back to this and say (laughs) you know what maybe i was a little too rough on it you know what that's fair i love that you're given that background for you in this movie that context and you you threw me for a loop with that hall of fame idea because we already talked about early in this episode where you know yes we started with the idea of a late night movies list one list But with Book of Henry, it kind of diverged into three lists, you know, the mine, yours, and ours. (laughs) And (laughs) and now we have, like, those three, but there's Hall of Fames within them. Like, there's – I'm not thinking of it it as Hall of Fame. I'm thinking of it more as if you pick this version of the list, this one's one of the top ones. What do you think about that? 
I'm not even. I wasn't even thinking of an actual list for categorical reasons. I sure. was just this, just to show how significant this is to me. That's why I'm saying, like, I know. Okay, I guess, but, but I, if I think, there was a hat, if there was a hat with your late night movies, and inside that hat there was a smaller hat, like glued to the top, so it was easier to pick from. This movie would be in that smaller hat. Uh, for you is what you're saying. Like you'd be ready to show it to somebody. Yes. Okay. Like before, I, 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 I might not. Plan. I might not agree or even understand the hat analogy, <laughs> but but I agree with again the conclusion of it. I would say that yes. Like if somebody like somebody came to me, and like I said, like Rob did. Like how again we call we call the uh, art imitates real life or real real life imitates art. It's that Rob says, okay, we want to do cinematis. What are we thinking about? So like I had like I went around when we were curating our initial like. Not a short list, but the long list. And it's like, okay, things I was writing down. I don't own, I didn't own Men, Women, and Children. I had to get it from the library. I do not own it. So I, I, I just stumbled across it. But after rewatching, I remember even Rob heard me say this when we were, like, we were recording like our uh, Batman versus Superman and like our fantastic plan. I said, I have not watched it. And I'm a little hesitant to rewatch it because I don't know if it's going to hold up. Because I remember, I, all I remember was that it was a bad movie. That's all I remember. It was a bad movie, and I did not remember anything about it. And I'm going to be honest. When watching it that second time, after, after three years, and I got to the point with J.K. Simmons and the girl who has, like, the quasi, like, miscarriage, I died laughing. Oh, I did not hold back. I died of laughter. Not, again, I'm not laughing at the traumatic experience that happens to real people. That's not <laughs> what's funny. I'm laughing at how poorly the movie handled conveying yes. that to me and rob laughed at that too that sequence is comedic gold we're, we're I, gonna I'm probably, use that clip 80 times in this episode yes. don't daddy me <laughs> if this episode doesn't get to the full runtime of men women and children we're just gonna loop that for the last six minutes that's what we're <laughs> gonna do we're just gonna loop that whole entire sequence for sit just keep looping it until we get to an hour and 59 minutes mm -hmm. but i think we've stated our thought our final thoughts on this so we have one more question what snack do we eat during this film that is the next question. I just want to make it clear. We are splitting once again on this. Oh, the I don't think we'll ever have another split as hard as this. Okay, this is the hardest split we've ever encountered and possibly will ever encounter. Okay, this is good. Fifth, fifth episode in, and we've arguably hit our greatest divide. So we have nowhere, <laughs> for me, we have nowhere to go but down. For Rob, we have nowhere to go but up. So it's, it's a great in a horrible time for both of us. This is this is the greatest example of uh, concavity versus convexity in in audio history, I would say. Damn straight. Yes, we have to move on though. We have to ask the the absolute question. There are questions that are sometimes we do them, you know, we have to travel certain paths to get to, but there is one question that is absolute. It is when you watch this movie because very nicely as we said earlier, you should experience everything. This is not a show about recommendations. We are literally saying, watch it all. You should experience everything. While you're experiencing this movie, what snack do you eat? Zach, I have one. I have a good one, I think. I have one, too, but you go first. Okay, so um, you should eat celery while you watch this movie. But while you're eating the celery, you should sniff arsenic. <laughs> come as close as you can to mimicking poisoning yourself to death, but not actually doing it. That's my snack. Okay, well, I, I, I have an alternate twist on that, but it's very similar to the, the scenario Rob presented. Okay. Um, Ro Rob says you shouldn't watch this movie, but Never. much like anorexic girl, when she's tormented by the shepherd's pie, she eats the celery, so she gets the aroma of it, but she's consuming the high uh the very high metab metabolic celery so what i recommend you do is you put on your favorite movie you put on one of your favorite movies but instead of watching the movie you listen you hear in the background but you hold up the dvd box of men women and children in front of you so you hear your favorite film yet you only experience the cover art of men women and children <laughs> that has nothing to do with food, while you're eating celery or is there is there no, no eating there's no involved. food involved there's no what there's no, no you need food for the snack. no it's a snack it's a snack for the mind what? No, this is where I draw the line. We need actual <laughs> food, Zach. We can't have a snack okay. for the mind. Okay, okay, 
I'll concede. I like my... the idea, but while you're doing that, what are you eating? <laughs> while you're while you're holding, okay, you've you've created some sort of weird like hat rack that holds the DVD box in front of the TV <laughs> while your favorite movie is playing. That's not Men, Women, and Children. But while you're doing that, you make an omelet and you put everything on it you can. It distracts you from your personal problems with your wife, girlfriend, oh. teenage lover, uh, pornographic teenage daughter. Your uh, Kingdom's Quest playing son, you make an omelet with as many toppings that distracts you from your real world problems. Ooh. <laughs> you make an omelet and you scream at it. What do you want, you eggs? <laughs> what do you want, you eggs? You make an omelet that tastes like adultery and infidelity. And Adam Sandler. <laughs> Adam Sandler's, yes, Adam Sandler's insane beard. I feel like you just need to like get a piece of cardboard and grate it like on a cheese grater <laughs> Omelet, and that'll give you the taste of Adam Sandler. I figure what you do is just get a piece of cardboard and write omelet on it and eat that. <laughs> okay, Zach, I have one one last thing to ask you in during okay. this episode. How do we end it? Have you thought about this at all? I, I have not considered how we end oh the episode God. to the greatest what? film in cinematic, cinematic you... history. But how, how have we ended? I don't even remember how we ended any of the previous episodes. I, neither of I. I think we should end it with the reverse intro music. You know what? That just makes the most sense. It's a good kind of a bookend to our to our episode. Why don't we do that? 